Can we hear them? I can Hi, hear myself. I don't hear them. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Four, five, six. six. Okay. Eight, nine, ten. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect. Now we can hear Donna too. Okay, good. Cynthia? Hello. Okay. And I think we can get rid of the chat or from your right. I would get rid of whoever is taking the, I think this is in that computer, John. Can I recommend, yeah, can I recommend, it's okay. called hide self view. Uh, if John does that, then you'll see Dana. Okay. So what do we see on the stage? We see interviewers on the stage as well as a speaker. <laughs> they will interview, but also the speakers we will interview here. And to be honest, I don't know how to set it because you want to actually interview these ladies, but you don't want to stand with your back to the hall. <laughs> so feel comfortable to move at the stage. The moment you want to ask specific questions, Lady, please stand up and just turn around, but don't show your back. Face half they here, half they were there. Make sense? Saying that, let me introduce our interviewers. I mean, the students and facilitator of girls who could. I will start with students. Here is Andrea O'Neill. Wave everyone just like, hey, here's Andrea. Okay, here's her first year with girls who could. What? and grade you are at. And a senior in high school. And she has to learn to speak up. This is always the challenge. So now you have to practice it. <laughs> Say it again. I'm a senior in high school, everyone. High school senior. OK, Andrea. Next is Denise. Denise? Vaquero. Huh? Denise Vaquero? Speak louder. My name is Denise Vaquero, and I'm in eighth grade. Eighth grade, perfect. Okay, this, this is your first year with girls who code too, right? Yes. Are you making friends? Yes. Are you having fun? Yeah. That's cool. Okay, and look at this, another Vagera family, representative Cindy Vagera. Those two sisters, yes, that's true. <laughs> uh, so hi everyone, my name is Cindy Vagera. Um, I'm a Mountain Mary College student. Perfect. So sister bringing sister. That's awesome, actually. <laughs> We're building dynasties here, right there. Okay, and now I'm introducing to our first speaker here, Andrea Tejedor. My name is Andrea Tejedor. I'm a former assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction and technology in the high Falls, Fort Montgomery Central School District. And I've been active in, to be involved in the instructional technology community in the region for the past 20 years. I recently retired and I uh, am exploring a new role as an education consultant and strategist uh, for an education uh, distributor, technology distributor called Trox. Awesome. And what are you doing now? You said a former? Former, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm a, um, education consultant and strategist, and I'm working with school districts around the country to build a technology profile for where they are today and map out their um, vision and help them achieve that ultimately so that we can really assess how the use of technology supports students learning and their learning outcomes. That's awesome. But also it's worth to mention that Andre Tehedor is leading our hackathon tomorrow. Okay, watch out you will experience the full power. Okay. <laughs> Saying that, it's turn time to introduce our speakers. And shall we start with Eva? Eva? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. And I'm happy to be here in 2D format, not 3D. But uh, my name is Eva Sofianos. I am in the Lehman College lecture and Deputy Chair of Computer Science. I see there are a lot of IBMers here. I'm a former IBMer, IBM Poughkeepsie and IBM Watson research. So I think I have some things in common with Andrea because I'm currently working on a computer science certificate for educators. Maybe we can chat about that after. But thank you. Should I pass it on to Cynthia? 
Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here with everyone. I'm Dr. Cynthia Marcello. I'm a professor of computer science and data science at North Central University and Uni uh, University of Maryland and former SUNY professor uh, for 14 years and former business owner uh, for 15 years. And uh, a computer science business, I should say, a software development and database development uh, business. And uh, I am very happy to be here. And um, mm -hmm. I'm currently writing curriculum for the data science space and the uh, computer science space as a software um, developer and subject matter expert. And uh, great to be here. All right, and I guess that just leaves me. Hello, everyone, and I want to let you know that it is an absolute pleasure to be invited to come back to the Hudson Valley Tech Fest this year. Um, I was a speaker last year. I'm excited to be back again this year. My name is Dana McMullen, and I lead the accessibility team, the website accessibility team at Sidearm Sports, which is based here where I live in Syracuse, New York. As their website accessibility specialist, we have clients at colleges and universities all across the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii. And whenever uh, there is a problem with the website where it concerns someone with a disability being able to navigate, um, whether it be um, on their mobile phone or on their desktop computer, what I do is I work with a developer and I also work uh, with the colleges and the universities to make sure that um, there are no accessibility problems. Um, accessibility is a civil rights complaint. And so when those issues are not resolved, uh, <laughs> folks can get sued. So I uh, help to prevent that from happening. Yeah, um, so I, I guess I can tell you a little bit about my history. I started in accessibility in 2002 at Syracuse University, where I helped uh, the then director set up um, uh, accessible solutions for uh, people who had visual impairments. So I've done a lot of Braille, um, electronic textbooks. We also did uh, website accessibility, and we also set up remote captioning for people who were uh, hearing impaired. And this was at the graduate as well as the undergraduate level. I left Syracuse University in 2005, and I set up um, accessible solutions um, across campus where I uh, made recommendations and installed software across the campus community. I also trained students and instructors um, on how to use a number um, of assistive technologies like um, Dragon Naturally Speaking, JAWS, which is a screen reader, um, also um, provided support for um, voiceover on a Mac, and um, also provided um, um, instruction and uh, information on PDF uh, accessibility, PDF documents. So yeah, that's an overview for me. Glad to be here. Hello. Hello. So, hello. My first question for everyone is how do you all feel that the tech industry has changed in the last five to 10 years? Sure. My first question is how does everyone feel that the tech industry has changed in the last five to 10 years? Well, I can jump in really quick. Um, I know as both a professor and also someone who works in the field and someone who has been very passionate about uh, working with women and, and underrepresented individuals in the tech space, I've seen a huge shift in the adoption of collaboration and synergistic uh, efforts to make sure that everyone has the ability to contribute to solutions um, that are, are really desperately needed out there. So I think 
if I were to, you know, highlight one specific aspect, I think people are becoming more brave on coming out and sharing their ideas and feel, feeling empowered that their ideas can make a difference. Uh, whereas, you know, when I first started as a student at Lehigh University in the 90s, um, you know, women weren't always allowed to speak their mind uh, in the realms of technology. So I've seen a huge shift in uh, women being accepted in uh, their input. And uh, that's a very exciting uh, trend that uh, is, is really rewarding. I agree with what you said, Cynthia, and I would like to add in the past decade or a little more, open source has really sped things up, having many people collaborate on projects and push them to where they need to go has really made a change and set a different pace for progress. So I look forward to you know, seeing things happen in the future that we haven't even thought of yet. And with addressing the females in tech, you know, not that many, at least we're improving. And it'll take time to see more women in tech, but one step at a time, we'll get there. And you know, we have strong advocates, male advocates that we work with, or I know that I do, and I'm sure that you as well do, where we can all find the balance, make things work, make progress, and be innovative. So I'll hop into the discussion now. Um, I am really in love with how technology has helped to transform the higher educational landscape, as well as grades K through 12, as we have seen with the pandemic with kids having to stay out of school and learn from home. Um, but when it comes to the higher educational front, I've seen this boom of educational opportunities that can be taken advantage of on the internet um, where, you know, before if you had uh, difficulty with driving or if you didn't have a car or if you had to stay home maybe five or ten years ago you did not have access to um, virtual learning the way that you do today so um, and and um, you know we're also seeing changes with um, price you know the, the um, and what's being offered I mean th there are a lot of free things out there so Google, is offering free and low cost opportunities. I know that a lot of people use Udemy, Coursera, um, things of, of that nature. So, um, and, and also where it concerns um, entertainment, like uh, if you have Wi-Fi or internet in your home, you can subscribe to Netflix. You can get, oh, what else is out there? Roku, Disney Channel, things of that nature. You pay maybe, I don't know, maybe 5 to $15 for the month. And you have all of these movies and television shows that you can have access to. I mean, and we know how expensive it, it, it is to go to a movie theater now, right? So for the price that you pay to go and see one movie, you can just sign up for a subscription and you'll have access to um, lots of shows. So re really excited to see all that change. Now, don't get me wrong. I miss Blockbuster. <laughs> but. This is more convenient. I, I love what you just said, Dana. Um, one of the things that I just remembered is I think li the library space has changed in that it is now embracing technology in a, a bigger way. And there's nothing more rewarding than going to your local library and seeing, you know, people from all walks of life coming in, whether it's senior citizens coming in to learn how to use a computer, or it's maybe a, a young group of kids learning about the, the benefits of reading and mm -hmm. reading a, you know, a physical book or versus doing robotics at the library or all the different activities that they offer. Um, a rich array of activities are now offered in those spaces. And I think that's something that's really important that in after school programs and things like that, technology is kind of weeding its way into all of those different uh, areas and you know just 
going to your local library, you can now take some really great tech courses and workshops and, yeah. you know, get involved with those things. Sure. Yeah. And this disruption of technology, you know, depending on what side of the fence you're on, you can see it as a good thing or you can see it as a bad thing. You know, I, I'm i sure we all know of folks who have lost out on maybe jobs or opportunities that were available a few years ago that are no longer available now. I have to tell you, I was shell-shocked when I was riding on the highway with my mom a few days ago, and there are no toll booth um, personnel. Like, everything is electronic. I, I had not traveled on our throughways in a long time. I was not expecting to see that. Maybe Remember the can, can add something to that too. Well, in terms of um, Andrea's question, one of the things that I've seen in, in terms of evolution in technology over the last five to 10 years in school districts, when I joined um, the school district where I was for over a decade, uh, we had, we were all hardwired, right? And there was no wireless. We had a wireless um, hub on a cart where a few computers could connect to the internet through, through that. But there was not um, wireless in our schools at all. And so we had to build the infrastructure to make that happen. And um, over the course of the um, two or three years, we were able to put that infrastructure in place, which of course then grew to experimenting with um, putting in Wi-Fi so that we could use wireless devices and start experimenting with wireless devices. And over the course of the next five years, um, we grew to the point where we were one-to-one -one with Chromebooks for our students in grades pre-K through 12th grade. And then of course the pandemic hit. So we were well prepared in terms of devices for that. Um, we had to help our families at that time, make sure that they had wireless at home and we were able to provide anybody who needed it with access to a wireless access point so that the students then could connect. Um, they had device, they had access, but then it was a question of um, the skills to use the devices, not necessarily for the students, but for the families. So our families really struggled with supporting their children with connecting to their teachers and to um, the educational opportunities online because we had to really change um, we had to really educate our parents on how to use the devices that the students were already familiar with. Um, also, so, so the evolution was, you know, going from hardwired to wireless to getting devices and now, of course, accessing content. And one of the things that Cynthia mentioned was our libraries. Also, what we've seen in our schools is the evolution of spaces and, um, you know, in, instructional approaches because of access to the technology and now students can access their teachers or their content from any place in the classroom. So we've seen um, libraries really take the lead in redesign um, where the stacks are now pushed back to the walls and um, the center spaces are collaborative spaces where students can learn together. There's collaboration tables, um, there's maker spaces, there's 3D printers, there's uh, laminators or, and I don't know, laser cutters, laser printers, there's all these things mm -hmm. in libraries that you can use to build and create. And so I think one of the things that we're seeing as a result of this influx of technology is this need to really empower our students to use it in creative ways um, and really give you those opportunities mm -hmm. to reach out to audiences you never had before. For sure. Yeah. Very good responses. Um, I'm going to let now Denise come up here and share her question. Um, my question for you today is, <laughs> how did the Is she frozen on your screen? Seemed to freeze, yep. Yeah. We'll, we'll need her to ask that question again because she froze on our screens. My question was, how did the tech industry affect your life and what difference did it make? I can speak to this really quick. Um, <laughs> in the 90s, I started my own business as a computer consultant out of my home. 
And I'll never forget, you know, I was doing web development and database development and software development. And I posted a $25 uh, Yahoo ad for my services and uh, thought to myself, you know, I was in the middle of the Poconos and what would be perceived as a cabin. And uh, I landed a contract with the Department of Defense from that. Uh, that was an $80,000 gig. <laughs> okay. Um, and I never thought that, and again, this is when the internet was superbly young. And um, I never thought that, um, A, my business would be successful uh, to that level. Uh, you know, you can be an optimist all you want and you can be very, uh, you know, uh, confident in your skills and very happy to, you know, jump all in. Well, I never expected that. So I think one of the things that I would want to share with everyone is that you want to take a chance on yourself, take a chance on your opportunities that come your way, be thankful for the blessings that come along your way, and um, you can make a difference. So... So I guess I'll go next. Um, so the world of technology has opened up all kinds of doors for me that I never pictured would be open. Um, ever since I was a little girl and there was the Apple computer sitting in my sixth grade classroom and I learned QBasic, I've always had this um, love. It's more of a love affair, but it's kind of like a love-hate thing because, you know, you hate them when they don't work well right but um for the most part um just taking the courses that I took at Andaga Community College and in computer information systems um and then going through um the careers in code boot camp more recently which was it was a tough, tough program, but the organizer of that program said, you know, if you can get through this and graduate as a full stack web developer, it will change your life. So, you know, folks can tell you that, but your level of success also depends on your own self-determination. And I put everything that I could into that 24-week boot camp. That helped me to land my first two internships before I even graduated. I got another internship after that. And then um, I worked with an employment specialist at the On Point for College program who helped me to clean up my resume. And she said to me, you know, you need to put this up on LinkedIn. And I did that and forgot about it for about a year. And then bam, here I am, <laughs> accessibility specialist at Sidearm Sports, right? So how it's changed my life is that, um, you know, when you get into a career, you want to make money, right? No matter what you're doing. So I am, I, I would say that I'm definitely at the income level that I feel I need to be to support myself and my family, which is, you know, important. I feel like I have job stability and I am in a career that I love because it's the perfect combination of being able to help people and work with technology. So I would say that no matter what field of technology you go into, if you have the basics down for where you, where you decide you ultimately want to go, if you just want to be someone who is just comfortable being behind a computer and you don't really want to deal with people, well, technology has a place for you. If you're someone who is like, you know, I like technology, but I don't want to be stuck behind the computer all day as a coder programmer. I want to do something tech adjacent, like maybe project management or something like that. You, you can do that also. So as far as the changes that, that it's made in my life, I'm exactly where I want to be at, at this point. So, um, you know, I would say for anyone who's not have is on the fence about whether or not they want to go into technology as a career, I say give it a chance. There's plenty of opportunities out there and it can change your life like it changed mine. Everything's great over here. <laughs> So I guess I can go next. I never thought that I would be where I am uh, as a child, I guess. And 
to give you a little bit of background, my father didn't even finish the fifth grade. My mother kind of got a GED, maybe. And I'm a girl from the Bronx or Washington Heights, depending on how you look at it. And I had to work to help pay the bills as a kid and didn't know if I was gonna be able to finish high school even, let alone pursue graduate studies. So enough with the sob story, everything turned out great. I ended up uh, working, juggling, finishing high school, initially studying accounting in Greece, and then coming back to New York, did some back and forth, and realizing that I love computer science. Uh, work to pay through college, realized I needed an internship because otherwise I would not be able to get a job in the field and said, well, I have to find a paid internship. I need to pay the bills. This is where I can relate to my students so well because I feel their pain. It's, it's difficult. And I saved up just enough money to take a risk. Now, I don't necessarily advise this, but I, I to take a risk and take an unpaid internship initially. And then after that unpaid internship, not only did I have something good on my resume, but I was able to get a paid internship, another paid internship, a co-op ship, longer term, a full-time position, and break the boundaries of basically poverty. And although I don't like to use that word because I always had food on the table, luckily. Um, and go to IBM Research. I had some really good recommend recommendations from people at the college and they believed in me. So I went for more interviews and got the position. And one thing after another, uh, here we are about 20 something years later and I'm now back at Lehman College. Uh, I took a basic pay cut so I can leave corporate America, but give back to the community that helped me break those boundaries. And I just, I didn't know as a child that you could be passionate, passionate and pay your bills. I didn't know that you could, you know, juggle, find people who will support you and be advocates for your talent and help you see the light, see where you needed to go uh, and, and just move forward. Now I know that. And I want to help others when they have a question of like, you think I can do this? Try it. You, you think you can tell me what comes next? Well, now, since I've been around the block a few times, I have a better idea of what comes next. Can't predict the future, but just like my co-panelists here, we have a good idea of how things play out. And I'll speak for you because you already said it, that you're kind of grateful. And I'm grateful to be where I am today and have seen and done the things that I have done, met the people that I have met and use technology to move forward. So with all of that in mind, I want to say that yes, you can fulfill your dreams. Yes, you can find something that you're passionate about. Now, if you are interested in tech and interested in being a developer, great. If you're interested in being a user of tech because you have some other cool, let's say even a startup idea or whatever it might be, that's good too. Now, technology can open your doors whether you are a creator, a user, a friend of a creator, or you know someone who can search for you because you haven't sharpened your skills yet. But anything is feasible, and well, almost anything is feasible within <laughs> logical you know, realms. So that's all. I think 
I can give it to Andrea and uh, hear what she has to say. It was so important to hear the real experience firsthand and seeing you getting emotional. And I have to mention here, because you probably don't see the access to speaker's bio, that Eva is running Google Developers Group in Bronx, and she is doing, we don't see it. Okay. So she is doing a lot of community development. She is nurturing her community the way she actually was probably <laughs> benefit, would benefit getting nurtured. That's what we do here. We nurture each other and help each other, just uplift each other, right? But let's not forget about our speaker in person. Andrea, what's your experience? So I have to echo a lot of what um, my co-presenter said, my co-panelist said. I, I never envisioned um, being where I am today, ever. I actually, um, when I went to college for my undergraduate degree, I started studying electrical engineering at RIT in Rochester and um, proceeded to fail out. And so knew that I had to regroup and find a different a different pathway. Ended up graduating with a degree in economics, fine, but never knew what I wanted to, to be when I grew up, I guess I have to say. And I dabbled with a lot of other positions, running nonprofits, buying and selling fine art and antiques for a while. Um, anyway, ended up going to Mount St. Mary College and I got a degree in a master's degree in elementary education. And after being in the classroom for a few years, decided I wanted to try something else too, because I get very interested in a degree in instructional design and technology. Ended up going back to school for a degree um, at Seton Hall University. And while I was there, um, a professor really took an interest in me and asked me to apply for their doctoral program in education, leadership, management, and policy, which I, which I did. So while I was studying for my doctorate, finished the degree in instructional design and technology, um, I was working with teachers in my previous school where I had been teaching um, to build different interactive instructional tools for interactive whiteboards. At the time we had smart boards where I had gone to school, right, where in teaching actually. Um, but I got a job as a professional development specialist for instructional technology at Obosis in New York State and ended up um, teaching two teachers and providing them with support to learn how to use different instructional technologies in our four county regions. So teaching in about 50 different school districts. And I did that for four years. Um, but that door opened up the opportunity, that, that opened up the door to go to a school district as a director of innovation and instructional technology. And that grew to my position as an assistant superintendent in Highland Falls. Um, never would have dreamed that I would be, you know, pulling cable, cat six through ceilings to put internet drops in classrooms um, because I had to. Never dreamed that I'd be worried about cybersecurity attacks and, and the breach of student and staff personally identifiable information. Um, never dreamed that I would be um, talking to school districts around our country about how they can create a blueprint to help them move forward and really implement um, plans so that they have the instructional infrastructure for students to benefit from the instructional technologies that we have access to today. So never would have dreamed any of it was possible. Um, I'm very grateful for the doors that have been opened because I chose to go down this pathway. Um, not a lot of women sitting at tech director's tables, but there's a few of us. And, um, but we always found that the conversations were very supportive. We always approached problem solving together. And I think um, I'm so grateful for the people that I've met along the way that one, number one, believed in me and empowered me to, and pushed me um, to take that risk and to be brave enough to go out there and have those conversations and to be brave enough to um, really push other people to, to join with me and build those communities where we support each other and we try to make things happen. So I agree with all of that. And it's really a pleasure to be a part of that learning experience, um, whether it's virtually here with everybody or whether it's, um, you know, in my digital life and in my leadership life. What other questions do you have for us? 
right. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, one of my questions is that what are some challenges that you faced, especially being women in the tech field? Um, and how did you overcome it? I'm going to jump in real quick with that one. Um, one of the challenges that I faced was I would sometimes feel like um, an imposter. Like, do I really know what I'm talking about? Um, because not, I'm not somebody who came at this from the nuts and bolts side of things. And here I am um, building networks, talking about switches, talking about the MBF and the IDF. And I really have no idea what I'm talking about. But um, I've listened enough that I can kind of piece it all together. Um, I'm not a network engineer by any means. Um, and then being able to sit down and have these conversations and, and I guess you say things enough and you believe what's coming out of your own mouth, right? And you like, what's that, you fake it until you make it. And, you know, again, allowing yourself to believe that you can do it and building up that confidence because there were things that I did not know about switches and closets and cables and cat six and cat five and wireless and building those networks. But um, so I think that that was a piece of it for me. It was like, how can I be credible when I don't even believe that I know what I'm talking about? So, so trying to finding, finding that um, again, confidence to boost you forward and then surrounding yourself by people who can um, be a part of that conversation. So you might have sort of that idea, but then how does it, how do you surround yourself by people who can make it happen? So to, to add on, like, um, how was, how did you do it to get that confidence up? Like, to not feel so... How did I do that? Well, I had, <laughs> I had family members that believed in me. And I think that along the way, I could see that people were believing what I was saying, even if I had doubts in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. So I developed like teacher leadership teams at the school district um, and te instructional technology leadership teams. And the teachers came on board and we started to build and create together things that I never could have done by myself. And I had um, technicians, network technicians that were a part of those conversations as well. And then they would add their perspective to it. So I think all those different lenses coming together towards a common conversation around something that I had started to sort of want to build and to see that everybody was sort of gathering around that and believing in it, um, I knew that I couldn't let them down. So I had to move forward and I had to do what we set out to do because they were relying on me to build it. Thank you. If I can just go next. Um, what I can offer to the conversation is that I had to overcome the challenge of being afraid to ask for help. I want to say that the tech community here in New York State is the warmest, most welcoming group of people that you would ever want to work with or work beside in your life. I'd never experienced that before. Um, it was through the Careers and Code program that I learned about uh, the, the different meetups here in central New York and around New York State. And so going to meetups like OpenHack, the JavaScript meetup, the Women in Machine Learning, there's another group called Women in Code, which uh, by the way, I'm a part of their leadership and I, I do workshops for them. But you go to these workshops and you meet people and people make time for you. They don't care how many questions you ask. Um, they'll give you their LinkedIn information. They'll give you their Slack information, you know, and when they say, you know, hit me up, it doesn't matter if you're in school or on the job, you know, I will mentor you. They say that and they follow through. I I've never had anyone make, make me feel like I was asking too many questions or taking up too much of their time. And so as I see um, others who are coming through schools or 
boot camps, um, you know, the, the one thing that I can say that makes a difference is just having someone there along the way to kind of hold your hand and say, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you get through this. I'm gonna help you to push through this. I'm going to check on you to make sure that you're getting your work and your assignments done. And these same people, when they see what your self-determination is, when you meet them halfway and, and they know through your questions that you know what you're talking about, you, you know, you, you, you may not be quite there, but they'll recognize if you're on the right path. These same people will help you to get jobs. You, you'll be able to use them for references. I mean, I have, you know, a lot of times you don't even have to ask. They'll just offer, hey, you know, you, you're doing pretty good there. When, when you get ready to pass out your resume, feel free to use me as a reference. So these connections that you make by coming to HV Tech Fest, um, you know, through your internships and, and things like that. Remember, remember the people that you meet along the way, write their names down. You know, even, even us on the panel today, right? You guys are asking questions. You know, you, you never know where I'm gonna pop up. I am all over the place when it comes to these, these hackathons and these meetups. Walk up to me and say hello or, or hit me up in the chat because you know those of us who are already sitting in these seats we can tell you what it takes to get here it's not easy I mean I I don't in any way want to say that you know I started one day and the next day I was sitting you know in a in a leadership position um, at a, a major tech company let me tell I wanted to say, honey, no, <laughs> honey, I put in the work. So, um, and we're here to encourage you. We're here to encourage you to stay the course. Every little step that you take towards a career in tech is only going to lead to success. Just stay the course. Donna, you got my heart. Fully. Now you see why we invited these leaders, because they are actually amazing. They are uplifting you right here, right there, embracing, nurturing, and just saying, go, baby, go. You can do it, right? This is amazing. Thank you, Donna. You really, <laughs> yes, I love you too. <laughs> she is so special. She is doing community development in upstate, upstate. We are doing community development here. Eva is doing this in Bronx. We have Google Development Group in the Hudson Valley. We have a lot of communities here, technology communities. I shall say those are givers. We just need the space where we can meet and help each other. Make sense? But I didn't mean to interrupt, sorry. You have valid points though, Yulia. <laughs> so I agree the the struggle is real, but if we're stubborn enough and persistent enough, we get to where we're going. So my struggle has been finding time, time to keep up, time to learn more. Uh, and this is not a new struggle. This is an old struggle and it's actually one of the things that got me into computer science it's not boring ever there's always some change i remember trying to keep up with the initial changes in java jtk going from 1.2 1.3 1.4 1.5 what happened so fast and then a slow down now we're at i don't even know 13 was the last one did we change yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> you have to be careful what you say because tomorrow it's going to be different. Although I haven't checked the dates for when the next release is. But my point is, struggling is fine. It's normal. It means you're growing. And we've all struggled. So that's a good thing. Finding people that will support you, even if you're not comfortable asking for help. I'm not comfortable asking for help. But uh, sometimes I do. Sometimes I do, or sometimes I'm lucky enough that someone will offer help. Hey, you, you're doing this, whether it's tech related or not. And building a support structure, building a team, meeting people, making connections in your day-to-day -day life through these events and however it's possible, wherever you work or learn, 
is really going to help with overcoming struggles. So I will hush now and maybe Cynthia, your turn. I'll go next. <laughs> yes. So speaking of struggles, um, I want to speak to all the nerds in the house. Okay. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that I've observed over the years, and, and I've experienced myself ever since I was a young child, um, I can remember in kindergarten, um, asking questions and, you know, being looked at like I was an alien. And um, I think one of the things that I will say is that when you, when you approach technology and computer science and you start asking questions that people don't fully understand or they don't know how to answer, sometimes they will push you away or ostracize you or, um, you know, uh, you don't fit into that box, right? Um, so I think one of the most important things that I've learned over the years, um, and uh, I didn't have computers in high school either. Um, so it's one of those things. And one of the things that I learned over the years is that you have to accept yourself and you have to accept that which you know and that which you don't know. And it's okay that you um, maybe don't have all that knowledge that you think you should. Part of the uh, issues with imposter syndrome is you're, you're holding yourself to a standard that doesn't exist. It's a societal standard that has been superimposed on you. And it could be a standard that you perceive is real. And, and it's very important to understand that how you perceive it, it's very important. But you also have the ability to perceive the potential that you have as an individual to affect change. And I have to tell you, as someone who's worked with uh, many students in computer science camps and robotics camps and game development jams and things like that, there is nothing more rewarding than seeing growth and someone that you mentored or, or um, helped. And um, it's, it's, it's never about the money. It's about the difference that you saw in a person that you worked with and seeing that change. And I can remember, I'm just gonna share one, one story very quick. Um, leading a computer science camp at the college and there was um, only two girls and the rest were boys. <laughs> and um, I can remember when the girls first came in, this was like an eight week camp, their body language was timid and scared and not sure. And they didn't know if they should join the boys and they had more energy than them. And you could see they were, they were judging themselves based on that which was around them. And the boys weren't sure how to take the girls. And, you know, so my job was to kind of pull everyone together. And I can remember about four weeks into the camp, one of the girls saying to one of the boys, I know what we should do. They were programming the robot and it wasn't doing what they were wanting it to do. We need to do this, this, and this. And the, and the boys just looking up at them and saying, oh my God, I would have never thought of that. And the big grin on the girl's face. And at the end of the, the, the computer science camp, one of the girls said, I am so glad that I had this opportunity to take this camp because I would have never seen myself as a programmer. I would have never seen myself as capable. I would have never dreamed that it was possible for me. And that pretty much sealed my, you know, as, as the instructor, that pretty much sealed it for me because every single student had, had experienced growth in themselves, in the, as, you know, teammates with each other. And so when you decide to get into, into technology, it's less about you and more about them. And um, being able to, to bring about positive change is what is fulfilling but that change happens within and outside of self. And um, so that's just something that I think challenging, accept yourself no matter where you're at in the continuum of what you're learning, it's okay because technology will continue to evolve. We can't stop it. Um, and so, you know, uh, speaking to Eva, what she was saying, you know, JDK, I'm teaching that right now for game development. And it's like, oh my gosh, are we at 14? Are we at 16? I don't know. You know, it's like, wait a minute, I, I slept last night and they developed a new one and pushed it and I wasn't watching. I rested. Um, <laughs> so um, the important thing is it's okay to not know, knowing where to find the answers. And that's important. That's important. So. Thank you, so, can I add one thing um, as far as a challenge? And this was 
in my head from when we were talking about the library, right? And, and you mentioned how the library has changed. So way back when, if we needed to find information out, figure out how to do something, either we, you know, made our fingers bleed or we marched our, you know, our feet down to the library and tried to find a book that was somewhat relevant because technology is changing so fast that the books can't even keep up. Now, quick search and we're ready to go because there wasn't content on the internet, even if we had access to a computer. So that's all. I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, technology is moving. There's lots of content on the internet. Internet, Check your, your sources <laughs> when uh, you find things, but uh, the struggle of having to find a relevant book uh, is kind of gone. You can find relevant content much easier without leaving your machine. I just want to piggyback on that just one minute. And I, I want to offer some advice on how to feel less challenged if you're going to embark on a career in tech. Pay attention in your classes now. Get used to reading now. Learn how to be a critical thinker now. Learn how to research. Um, learn how to become a think on your feet kind of person because you're not always going to have a roadmap when you go into these companies, or even if you decide to start your own business, you are going to have to figure things out because things change so quickly. And so in order, in order to do that, you're going to have to use every single tool at your disposal to continue pushing forward, or you're going to find yourself behind. So I, I, find, I find myself using everything that I've ever learned in life, including how to talk to people, right? How to, how to keep morale high within your department, especially if you're a leader. You, how people feel ar around you when they're working around you, when, when they're on your team, that's important. Treat people the way that you want to be treated, but also be a person who is able to, you know, read and understand, think, think on your feet. So that way, when things change, as they always do in tech, um, you can stay either on top of your game or ahead of the game. Awesome. I don't think we have much time left to bed, right? Because I want conversation to continue. So what I'm wondering if we have any questions from audience, maybe just to wrap it up with one question. Yes, okay. We have volunteer, come on. Thank you, Yulia. Hi, everybody. Mike is here. Okay. Um, thank you. Should I look here? Should I look here? Love that jacket and that hat. Many blessings. I appreciate that. I'm going to look at you on the screen, I guess, or I'm going to direct it here. But um, my name is Anusha Mehar. I have the wonderful privilege to do some work with Open Hub and these lovely students on this stage. And one of the things that I love the most about tech is that it exists at the intersection of virtually every other profession at this moment in time in 2021. There's not an organization or an industry or an institution that is not some way involved with developing an app or already has one or um, encoding you know, all of their information online. And so that can be, I think, so inspiring on one hand, and then when I put myself in the position of perhaps being a young person entering into the field, I think that can also be extremely overwhelming. Um, and so my question is, how did you find your niche in tech? And, um, and how is it, I heard a lot of you talking in different circumstances about the all of the experiences that informs like where you are now. And so how did you find your niche and what advice do you have to these young women in particular um, in regards to how they can find um, the place that feels aligned in their own integrity 
um, particularly at a time where I think, um, you know, entering into the corporate field is not necessarily the end all be all priority so much as um, aligning yourself with a values and mission aligned organization for your own life and priorities. That's questions. <laughs> Well, I'll jump in. I, go ahead. Oh, you. Okay. Um, I always feel like I'm a teacher first. I actually started teaching Spanish to preschool students. Um, so I view myself as an educator first and foremost. And everything that I have done from the time I started um, teaching to, to today has been driven by that. Um, when I was when I was a professional development specialist working with teachers, when I was a teacher in the classroom, as a director of technology, as an assistant superintendent, it was always about what does this do for our kids, and how does this benefit them, and how does it benefit their learning? Not necessarily their learning outcomes from a quantitative perspective in terms of their score on state test, but in terms of who they are as a person and how that can help them develop. Um, it was always about, and this will sound cliche, I understand, but empowering their voices and giving them an outlet for a voice. So it moved beyond the people in the classroom to potentially um, an audience worldwide. So as I got deeper and deeper into the technology, I felt that I was giving the students more and more opportunities to express themselves and to be a part of a larger community. Thank you. That's a that's an awesome uh, story, Andrea. And I kind of have a similar one. Um, when I was a student at Lehigh, I majored in psychology, and technology was not a big thing. You know, it was in the '90s, but I worked with autistic children. And one of the things that I noticed in our lab was that one of the boundary issues that they had was they were given a very we're going to call it a very non uh, uh, complex computer to work with. Um, as a means of basically reward for good behavior, right? But the software that was on the computer was very, um, it was very limited. And so the point I'm trying to make is that at that moment that I saw the, the, the student, the child frustrated because they couldn't work with the software, it didn't support their learning abilities, it didn't support their uh, you know, some of the students were nonverbal. It didn't, it just didn't support them. I decided at that moment, even though I was a psych major and I loved human behavior, I wanted to develop software that helped students in the classroom with, with disabilities and autistic children. Um, I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't know what was involved. I didn't know any of that, but I knew that I wanted to change the machine because the machine wasn't supporting the needs of the user in front of that machine. Another, uh, just a very quick, um, you know, uh, when I was in the classroom with another group of students, um, the nonverbal students would use assistive technology to speak in a group setting. So they had this little robotic type of device that would basically speak for the student when, you know, they wanted to say please or thank you or hello or just interact with their peers. And I thought, well, this is very interesting technology. I don't fully understand it. I want to get to know it better and understand the extent to which it actually facilitates change in that person. And just watching that student being able to be part of the group and not be ostracized because he wasn't verbal, to me, that, that signified in me that I need to learn more about how this software works. I need to understand better how it can affect change in someone's life. And so that was basically, um, that was a pivotal point for me. Um, that's, that's what drove me to learn how to write software and how to marry my love of psychology and behavior to the technology. And now, of course, it's, it's expanded into machine learning and machine behavior, but they're all systems. So, um, yeah. Thank you so much. I love that. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll go next. <clears throat> um, I was in my final semester, uh, computer information systems at Onondaga Community College. Prior to um, enrolling in my final year, um, disability services 
was down the hall from the department that I, I was currently working at. So I was, I was in school. I think I was in school full time. Yeah, I was in school full time and I was also working full time. And so um, I was an office assistant for the, the, uh, the collegiate science and technology entry program up at SU. Loved my job. And disability services was way down on the other end of the hall. So the director, she would stop by my desk from time to time. She said she just, she loved my personality. Um, you know, the way that I treated the student workers and everyone who came in, she said I was always smiling and saying hello. And she, she knew that I was um, enrolled in school for, for CIS. And so I guess she just kept that information tucked in the back of her mind for when she would need it. Well, lo and behold, she hired someone to be her assistive technology specialist who decided a week before classes was to start that he was not coming to Syracuse University. And it left her in a bit of a quandary because she had a lot of materials that had to get prepared for um, two students who were, on, who were on the graduate level and electronic textbooks needed to be created, braille needed to be created and so on and so on. And so she stopped by my desk one day and offered to uh, offered me a job that she claimed would double my salary. And she said, well, there's only one catch. <laughs> You're just going to have to stay, you know, connected to me hip to hip for at least the next month or two so that I can show you everything that you need to do. And when I tell you that is what literally happened, I'm talking about breakfast, breakfast lunch, dinner, weekends, nights, <laughs> learning how to support students with a wide range of disabilities. And she sent me away to Florida by myself for a whole week to become JAW certified. I cried on the third day. I'd never traveled without my family, but I mean, I got myself together and I did it. Well, my mother told me to get myself together, but that, <laughs> that's beside the point. Um, so I say that to say she saw something in me and she used me for what she needed me to do. But the job was only supposed to be interim, temporary. I wound up getting the job full time. I had to go through a search committee. I was terrified. It was that I didn't even know that there was that search committee was a thing in higher ed. So um, you never know who's watching you. You never know when an opportunity is going to pop up. When you just make up your mind that you're going to let your light shine and you're just going to be the best person that you're going to be, you see life as an opportunity to always learn and grow. Trust me when I tell you, others are going to see that also and doors will open for you that you have that you never imagined. And, and so I said that to say tech found me, my tech career found me. It was not uh, the, the thing that I wanted to do. I was supposed to be a webmaster. I am totally not a webmaster, but being an accessibility specialist, I still get to work with code. I still get to work with, you know, people. I still get to work with folks with disability and, it's been, it's been a wonderful journey. I've been truly blessed. Nice. Thank you. So, so how did I find my niche? How did I end up where I am? Well, initially, I didn't know that I wanted to study computer science. I always had a passion for puzzles, riddles. I wanted to be challenged. And I liked not always having to work with the same thing every day. That's just me. And my husband was taking a data structures course at the time, trying to solve Towers of Hanoi as his assignment. I'll spare you the details, but he was throwing papers that he had cut out to represent these discs all over the place and very upset. So can I see what you're doing? It's like, don't no, go away. I'm like, but well, you're very upset. Can I see what you're doing? 
So I saw what he was doing. I followed the rules. You can't put a larger disc on top of a smaller one. You can only move one at a time. You have a spare column that you can use. And I figured out how to move the discs. I said, this is what you do? It's like, yeah, kind of. Doesn't it suck? I go, no, this is awesome. <laughs> so I followed the path of computer science. And I said, I really need to find the job that pays better than my stinky french fry job because you know juggling work and school anyways make the very long story short after the internships that i mentioned and the job roles that i mentioned i was working full-time at ibm and part-time teaching as an adjunct at lehman college when i said you know what i really want to teach i really really want to teach full-time so I figured out how to balance my, my books and be able to teach full-time so that I could work with my students who were from similar backgrounds as me and see them succeed, help them succeed. And when I say help them, it's really just planting the seed and being there to, to hear any additional questions because all the hard work just like all our hard work has been ours. Yes, we've had support systems, but all the hard work is theirs. So that's how I ended up here. Towers of Hanoi, who would have thought? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to say that I what something that I heard you all say um, in different ways is that you had someone who believed in you or who mentored you. Um, or who saw something in you, even when you didn't necessarily see it in yourself. Um, and so I think that's a really solid reminder that um, it takes a village and that one person's journey is really all of our journey. And I'm so in awe at the way all of you have spoken about the ways in which you give back. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your awesome bravery to facilitate and ask questions in new environment. That was cool. I think we learned a few from each other. And the main thing is actually we're making this change right now, right here, all together. And thank you all because your presence is making a change as well. Let's give a round of applause to what happened today here. Thank you. Minute, okay, three minutes away from our networking cocktail and things. We have a minute to appreciate sponsors. Thank you, my favorite <laughs> women speakers, women <laughs> leaders, women in tech. I love you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who participates. Today. Thank you for our speakers, people who've been um, leading the conversations. This is fantastic. We, again, we're always big about making sure that these conversations continue wherever and ever online and Slack, keep the momentum going. I really appreciate again, you know, deeply thought your attention.